Good morning, everyone. We have time now for greetings and announcements. Brother Paul. Jane Kuzmanovich sends greetings. Thank you. Where are you on? So I'll both sends greetings. Thank you very much. Greetings from Clovis, where many of us were. Thank you. Mark and Tilda Bojanet send greetings from Colorado. Thank you. Brother John Lalea. Brother Sam. Okay, Brother Sam is announcing the birth of Noel May and uh, their appreciation for all that was done for them. Very good, thank you. Brother John Martin sends greetings, thank you. Just Sister Marilyn is at St. Jude still. Uh, some more work needs to be done, but thank you very much for the update. Um, okay, so going off to the written um, announcements, next Sunday, July 2nd, the Area Sing will be hosted by Lawndale. Our semi-annual business meeting is this afternoon following lunch. Our Sister Olga Meekly will be absent for two Sundays and sends her love and greetings um, she wishes to express her deep gratitude and appreciation to the Lord and to the CFG group that took time on Saturday morning to come out, that was yesterday, and do much needed tree trimming, landscape work at her house. Um, so she is very appreciative, very, very appreciative of that. Uh, Labor Day Retreat Flyer is on the bulletin board. Um, it's going to be held near Lake Arrowhead area. It's no longer, it's not in Colorado this year, it's, it's back to California. Uh, so be aware of that. September 1 through 4, um, the registration is going to open soon, but has not opened yet. Uh, greetings from Brother Matei Agostino, Lawndale. Uh, Sister Julianne Sfera, she's at home resting her leg, uh, leg, injured leg, and Sister Julie Kale. And then, of course, our prayer request reminder is included in our weekly bulletin. If there's nothing else, we'll turn it over to Brother Dave. Keep him in your prayers. Thank you, Brother Joe. It's good to be back home after a few weeks of being absent from your midst. Before we look into God's word, let's bow our hearts in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house of worship. And as we open your word and look into it, we ask and pray, Heavenly Father, that you would remove those things that would distract us from listening and hearing and understanding your will for us, your words for us. Speak to each and every one of us, Heavenly Father, and Lord, that when we leave this place, that we may ponder upon that, and that we may recall and bring to remembrance as the week goes on. We love you. We want to thank you, Lord, for your blessings, Lord. We want to ask and pray for your forgiveness where we have grieved your Father heart. But Lord, as we meditate on your word, we ask and pray that you would just distract those things that would hinder us from receiving your word in this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and we're coming to the last chapter. So if you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, and with the help of the Lord, we'll, we will be reading from verses 10 through, through verse 20. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that ye, may be, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand today, and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking on the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching whereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, utterance that may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And we will conclude with verse 20. The first word in this ver in verse 10 says finally. Finally is an implication of something coming to an end, a final port, a final point or movement, a final matter, a conclusive um, or decisive uh, matter, or as the last in series or events or, or of objects. When we think of finally, we think of, oh man, I finally finished that class. I spent four, two years, three years, four years. I finished college. Finally, I'm at the end. I took the finals. That's the final test. We think of the word finally when perhaps we're out hiking and we see there's hill above us and there's a plateau and you're, 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 just, you're, you're, you're making your way up to it and finally you get to the top. Apostle Paul says, finally. And what I'd like to do with the help of the Lord and bear with me, I want to go back to the chapters that he's written and I want to pull out some highlights. So if you can turn your, your uh, Bibles to the first chapter and I'm going to just pull a few so we can kind of build as we're coming up to this word finally. Kind of a synopsis. The first three chapters, as, as I mentioned before, is about Christ in us. So if we look in chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Just as he has chosen, uh, chosen us in him from the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus, and he's expounding to them of who they are in Christ and who Christ is in them. In verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So the, he's telling that we have been redeemed. This is a reminder for you and for me that we have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ according to his good will, his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself. In verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So it's because of his his love is because we have redeemed. We have an inheritance. We talked this morning about death. We have an inheritance. And to, be, to get that inheritance, to, to receive that inheritance, first we have to have that redemption blood of Jesus Christ on us, through us, being redeemed. And then we have this inheritance of eternal life. Then if we go into chapter 2, chapter 2, he, he says... And you he made alive who were dead in your trespasses, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, being according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once were, we, we, in whom we also, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, whereby nature children of wrath just as others. And he's reminding that at one point in our lives, we were just like them. 
But because we are in Christ Jesus, we are a new creature. We're living a new life. We are not walking in the walk that we used to walk before. And if we look at verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even where we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So we've been saved by the grace of God. There's nothing that we could have achieved or nothing that we could have done to receive this grace from God other than submitting ourselves to him. And raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are his workmanship. When we've taken on that new man, when we've, when we've uh, cre- become that new creature, when we have died to the old self, to the old world, we are now created to good works. And what, what, what are the works that we are displaying to those that are around about us? How do people see us? Do they recognize us as Christians? At, uh, at Pine Valley, when we had, had the devotion in the morning and talked about a little bit about this. And it was interesting, Brother Jim and I had a conversation afterwards and of, of how do people recognize that we are Christians? And he gave, shared with one of the examples, and I'm, Brother Jim, hope I can share this with, with, with the congregation, that where he goes to take get his hair cut, there are a veras- variety of people. And when you go there and you're sitting and waiting for your team, the conversations in a men's room of, of, of a barber shop, you can just imagine the conversation that goes on. And that, and Jim, Brother Jim didn't partake of that conversation, but there was another uh, subject that came up and they looked at him and said do you agree with that preacher you know I made the comment that you know as guys when we are next to other people at work can people see that you are not like everybody else it's a little bit easier perhaps for the sisters but for, for, the, for the brothers can we? Can somebody differentiate? Differentiate. Thank you, brother, brother Zoran. That one. I, I, can someone differentiate us between a Christian and a non-Christian? Christ in us. Do we display Christ? Can other people see Christ in us? Remember, verse 11 says that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you who are without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is, himself is our peace. And then verse 9, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members with the household of God, having now built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together grows into holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place in the Spirit. And then if we look in chapter 3, in verse 5 goes, In which other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as now has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and the partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus, in whom we have boldness, access with confidence through faith in him. 
This is what we have in him. This is Christ in us, in which we now have that boldness that we can go to the Father. And Apostle Paul in, in, in Hebrews also says, let us come boldly to the, throne, to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. And then in chapter 3, verse 5, he goes, in which other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as now has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through him. And then he gives the doxology in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is Christ in us. This is what Christ has done for us. And then in chapter 4 he goes on, we in Christ. How are we supposed to be in Christ? If Christ has done all these things, how, is we, how are we supposed to be in Christ? What is our walk? How do we conduct ourselves? And he says in chapter 5, first, that we walk in love, as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us. In verse 8, for you were once darkness, but now you, you are the light of the world. Walk as the children of light. And then in verse 22, it says... Uh, uh, I mean, in, in verse 15, it tells us that we need to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the times because the days are evil. That's our walk, circumspectly. Think about the, the walk that we have in Christ Jesus. This is us in Christ because Christ is in us. And then, and then he goes on in verse 20, from 22 to the end, it talks about how wives need to act to their husbands, talks about how their husbands are to act to their wives, parents, how they are to act to their children, and how their children are, act, are to act to their, to, to their parents, to the fathers, slaves, how they're to act to their owners, and the slave owners, how they're to act to the slaves. This is all, as Apostle Paul gives us, an accumulation, accumulation of the details on how we ought to live our lives as Christ, as Christians in Christ. In, in these six chapters, he's given us standards for unity, standards for life in the church, standards for the ministry. He's given us principles for, for purity, fellowship, how to be a witness, and what the Spirit-filled life looks like. A life that's controlled by the Spirit of God. And if we look in this overall book of Ephesians, it's about our walk worthy of the calling wherewith we are called. And then he goes into chapter 6. One of the things that we see here in this is that Apostle Paul said that once you become a Christian, once you have Christ in you, that life is going to be easy. He never said that it's going to be a, a cakewalk. He never said that it's, we're going to be walking in a, in a, you know, through, a, through a garden of roses where it's going to be beautiful and everything is going to be hunky-dory. No, quite the contrary. In other places, he said, look, he goes, you know, if they, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If they're trying to humiliate me, they're going to try to humiliate you. But Apostle Paul built all this up to come to verse 6, up to verse 10 in chapter 6, where he says, he says, finally, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And he said that for a reason. He said that because it's not going to be easy. And if you think about it, you know, we can say, you know what? Well, I'm not strong. I've failed many a times. I've tried and I've failed. I've fallen flat on my face. There's a saying that said, well, how come the only time, or, or somebody made a comment, how come the only time you look up to God is when you're on your back, laying, laying on your back? The Apostle Paul wants us to be strong. 
because he knows that our life is not going to be easy. We cannot be strong on our, on our own. You know, we, we, we have this battle constantly with the devil. Romans 7, where he says, you know, I should be doing the, good thing, the things that I should be doing, I don't do. And the things that I don't do are the things that I should be doing. There's a constant struggle between the spirit and the flesh. But he says... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. His might, not my might, not your might, but his might. This is the same might, the same power that that is in you and us, which is the spirit. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is in you and in me. And we have to have that power. We have to have the spirit within us because otherwise we will fail and we will fail continuously. Philippians 4.13, we're given a promise that if Christ is in us, if we have the spirit in us, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, no, tempt- no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but, fight- but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that what you are able, but with the temptation you will also make, he will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God has given us free will. God's given us choice. God's given us the ability to make the choice. So what are the choices that we are making? And because of that, because he knows that the devil is strong, He goes in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Because every day is a battle. You and I are fighting a battle every single day. The war has already been won. (coughs) But there's a battle that is warring against ourselves that we're constantly in in a fight with. But in order to be victorious, we need to know who are we fighting We have to understand to be victorious of the devil and his schemes. That's why he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And a couple of things that we know about the devil that's that's, that's written in scripture is, first of all, you remember that he tempted Eve in 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 the garden. Uh, He rebelled against God in heaven and he was thrown out. (coughs) Excuse me. That he fell from heaven. He deceives many nations. He tempted Christ in the wilderness. So if he tempted Christ, what makes you think he's not going to tempt you or me? He snares the wicked. We know that he fought with Michael, the archangel. He's fighting with him. We know that he's called the prince of the world. We know that he's called the prince of the power of the air. We know that he's called uh, the God of this age, Scripture says in Matthew. He's called the prince of demons. He's over 52 times he's called Satan. Over 35 times he's called the devil. He's called the evil one. He's called the old serpent. He's called a dragon. He's described in 1 Peter 5, 8 as the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's called the tempter. He's the accuser. He's a murderer. He's a liar. And he uses humans as subjects. We cannot be ignorant of his schemes. (coughs) And he uses different tacts, deceit. He's crafty. And he's subtle. Subtle. 
and he's been around since the beginning of this world. So without having this armor of God, without knowing his schemes, what chance do we have? First Corinthians 2 11 says, lest Satan should take advantage of it, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We cannot be ignorant of his schemes. Put on the full armor of God. It's the strength that we need, as is the armor that is given to us. You see, the beauty of this is Apostle Paul is not telling us, okay, now that you're in Christ Jesus, now go ahead and walk your life. Go ahead and do what you're doing. No. Because he knows that our life is not, our walk is not going to be an easy walk. <clears throat> and we wrestle not against flesh and against blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. And I think if we look at the events that are happening today and the, 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 what they're teaching our children in school, the mindset that people are having these days, I think Romans 1 really comes to mind. God's just letting them go, giving them over to their own, their own lusts. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, and I said that, they, that the devil used humans to do his bidding. A lot of times when I'm at work and I get confronted with, 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 with customers that are really flown off the handle and, 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 you know, and, and it's easy to come back and try to argue and fight and know and I have to stop myself and saying, well, you know, it's, it's, it's the devil behind him that's pushing them. And I think that we need to be sympathetic at times when we are running into situations with, with, with people that are just intolerable. But this life is a battlefield. And there are constant challenges and tests and trials. And he gives us this armor. And he goes on in verse 13 to put on the whole armor of God. Have you ever thought to just to think, Lord, this morning, give me the armor that I need. He starts in verse 14, standing have, Stand therefore, having your, loin, your loins girt about with truth, which is the belt that goes around, that holds our, 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 uh, uh, the sword that we have, that a soldier would, would be wearing. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, and I was thinking about that, that breastplate that covers the front and, and the protects the vital organs as well as the back. And I thought to myself, what's underneath that breastplate of righteousness? How many times do you and I think that we're righteous? But scripture tells us that our righteousness is but filthy rags. I thought to myself, if I got that breastplate, underneath that breastplate is just a scrawny old skinny bone man. But see, being in Christ Jesus, being that, having, being that new creature in him, accepting Christ as my Savior, I now have access to where I can put that breastplate on and go out there and I can fight the devil on a daily basis. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And he says, but of all, take on the shield of faith. Tell me what soldier is not, is not going to go or is, well, is not going to go into battle without a shield. Every time we see a, sh- a, a, a soldier out in battle, it doesn't matter where or what or how, there's always some sort of shield, something to protect them. Even though he's got the armor, <coughs> excuse me, even though he's got the artillery that he needs, 
but he always also has the shield. And it says it's the shield of faith. Are you and I carrying that shield of faith, brother and sister? Why? That we may be able to quench the fiery darts of the, of the wicked. I said Satan's pretty subtle. At times he can be pretty bold. Sometimes you don't even see it coming. And then afterwards you say, oh, oh, where did that come from? Perhaps I didn't behave like I was supposed to. Perhaps I said something I shouldn't have said. And as I said earlier, if Satan was bold enough to tempt Jesus Christ on the mountaintop, what makes you, you think that he would not tempt you and tempt me? Take the helmet of salvation. And this helmet of salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What he's done for you and what he's done for me. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Again, what soldier would go out to battle without being properly equipped and without having the, the, the um, weapon he needs to be successful? To be alive, to stay alive. And scripture tells us that our weapon, our weapon, is the word of God. So the question I ask you and the question I ask me is how much are we in the word of God? You see, the devil, when he tempted Satan, he came up and says, well, doesn't the Bible say, or doesn't it say this and doesn't it say that? And he was able to twist the words around. If we're not in the Word and we don't know what the Word actually says, what the Bible actually says, we may agree with what, he ha what he's saying, but it's actually, it's not. That's not what it means. We need to have the Word of God in our hearts. What did, what did uh, David the psalmist say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Are you taking the time to read and to be in God's word. Are you taking the time to study? Are you taking the time to remember God's word? And then it goes on. And it says, <clears throat> Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. So as much as you're in God's word, are you also in prayer? Do you have a time that you're sitting down and you're reading God's word and you're meditating upon God's word that you're not being distracted? I get it. Life gets in the way. I know you get up early in the morning. Uh-oh, you know what? I slept a little bit. I got to go. I got to be at work. Or perhaps you get up in the morning, you got a baby that's crying. You got to attend to the baby or you've got the little ones that need to get fed and they need to get clothed. And then at night, you need to get the kids ready for bed. And then dinner needs to be get on the table. I understand it. I get it. That's life. But somewhere in our day, we need to carve out some time that we can be in God's word and also in God's prayer, in prayer with God. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly. And not only for, for Apostle Paul, but for me too, and for you too. That when we are talking with our co-workers at work or our friends, that we may be bold in speaking the truth, the love of Christ. <clears throat> because he said, for which I'm an ambassador in bonds, therein I speak boldly, we also are ambassadors for Christ. We also are the ambassadors. We represent Christ. Our walk represents who Christ is.
We have a spiritual enemy, and in order to receive the promise, we will be engaging with that enemy in a daily basis. Not only daily, it's, it could be hourly, sometimes minutes. But we are encouraged to be strong. And the only way that we can be strong is by putting on the whole armor of God. And we are to take a stand against the devil. We are to be alert. And we need to be in prayer. Romans 13, 11, and 12 says, And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time. Awake, to be awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. In closing, and perhaps we can also sing this song. There's a beautiful song in in, uh, the Zion's Harps that's 115. And I'd like to read the verses to that. It says, put on God's armor to protect you with power from on high, for you all know how soon your human heart can misdirect you. How subtle oft the onslaught of the foe, with flesh and blood we do not wrestle solely, we have a battle with a host unholy. Put on God's armor when the ill days threaten, when all your realms of darkness rage and cry. Soon will the foe unto the ground be smitten. Call on the Lord, his help is sure and nigh. Your loins be girt with truth and with all uprightness, and as a wall around you shine with brightness. O take the shield of faith on it relying, and let it be your buckler night and day, knowing that its power will turn them all away. The spirit's sword, salvation's helmet take ye, All that is evil hate and error forsake ye. So pray ye now and never cease your praying unto the Lord and in your prayer endure, endure. For brother, now there can be no delaying. Well, for him who is in Jesus stands secure. Although a thousand arrows will fall around you, your enemy shall never more confound you. May God bless his word to each and every one of us. Last two verses of 115.
Father and our God, Lord, we bend our knees to Thee, Lord. Lord and Father, we're thankful for the message that we've heard today. And Lord, as we would consider the um, the warnings and the encouragements written down in Thy holy word, Lord, and of the need for us to properly equip, Lord, the um, armor of God. And Lord, as we would consider the dangers that are laid out in scriptures, Lord, and Lord, that our eyes would be open, Lord, and that we would understand the, the dangers that are around us, Lord, and Lord, as thy word reveals, Lord, the truths of the world we live in. And Father, pray that you would help us to be able to um, to yield our lives, and Lord, to be able to equip the armor of that is laid out, Lord, and, and to be able to um, exercise, Lord, the things that are written therein. Father, we thank you for um, all that you've given us. Lord, thank you for this church we could come to and um, have fellowship with one another, and Lord, gather around your word. Father, pray that we as a body of believers, Lord, would, um, would Lord, strive to be more like you. Lord, that each and every one of us would have a desire to go in that direction, Lord, of being more like unto the image of Christ. Father, we give you thanks for the food that has been prepared, Lord, and we're so blessed that we could even come here today and, Lord, ex um, have that expectation of feeding our physical bodies, Lord, and, you know, there's so many who don't have it as good as we do, and, Lord, we just um, thank you for this wonderful blessing. Lord, pray that you would continue to teach us and guide us throughout this day. Lord, pray for the uh, meeting in the afternoon, Lord, that you would also um, bless that meeting, Lord. And Father, we want to thank you, Lord, most of all for thy son, Jesus Christ, Lord, and his shedding of his blood and atoning for our sins on the cross. And, and Lord, giving us hope that goes beyond this life. Father, we thank you for all this in his name.